Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. On this first day of Black History Month, we're going to spend the next hour focusing on the challenges facing black people in America today. We're going to talk about everything from education to food insecurity to voting rights. We're also going to talk about the reasons for celebration, of which there are so many. But we begin tonight with the global pandemic and the myriad ways in which it is both highlighting and exacerbating racial disparities in this country. We already knew that Black America was getting hit disproportionately hard by coronavirus. Black Americans are dying from COVID at nearly three times the rate of white Americans. And now a new analysis by the Associated Press is revealing that Black people are also getting vaccinated at much lower rates. And the numbers, they're quite striking. In Chicago, Black people make up 30% of the population, but only 15% of those vaccinated. In Philadelphia, 40% of the population is Black, but only 14% of those vaccinated. In the state of North Carolina, 22% of the population is Black, but only 11% of those vaccinated. And in Maryland, 30% of the population is Black, but only 16% of those vaccinated. The disparities are undeniable. Structural racism and privilege are being exposed in ways that could not be more clear. Communities of color are dying at higher rates with less access to the health care and vaccinations that they need. The key questions right now are, how do we bring the vaccine to communities of color? And how do we convince those communities that it's safe to take? And joining me now is Democratic Congresswoman Gwen Moore of Wisconsin. So glad to be with you, Thank you so much for being here. It's so great. It's so great to have you back. What should we do? Uh, What should we be doing to close this racial gap when it comes to the vaccine? These disparities are becoming so crystal clear. They're so crystal clear because I, I tell you, institutional racism exists in all of our institutional institutions, where whether it's intentional or not. One of the things that I've noticed is that the people who are getting vaccinations already have an established connection with a primary care provider. So when people don't have insurance, they don't have connections to these big uh, hospital systems that are getting the vaccine, uh, then, then they won't be in the queue to be notified that it's, it's their turn. So I think that President Biden and his administration uh, demanding that we open up the marketplace for the Affordable Care Act is an extremely important step toward corralling and identifying those people who are disconnected from a healthcare system. Again, I think it's really important to engage the community health centers, people who have outreach beyond those people who have established uh, uh, care institutions and and providers. That's a really important point about Obamacare. I can't even imagine, you know, an administration's policy being to shut down access to health care during a global pandemic. Uh, But that's exactly what happened during the Trump administration. And to your point, uh, the Biden-Harris administration has reopened those exchanges so people can at least access uh, health insurance. Your state is one of the many states that does not break down vaccination rates by race. Do you know if there is any plan for the state of Wisconsin to change that uh, and, and make sure that the data they're collecting gives a more accurate picture of these racial disparities? Thank you, Zelina, for really raising that, because I think that the disparities in COVID mortalities for sure were discovered by what was happening here in Milwaukee County. And so uh, at that time, our health department uh, commissioner uh, noted that. Um, But you can't do it in a vacuum. I mean, it really takes the CDC, a state plan. Um, People were dying of causes, you know, uh, that perhaps were related to COVID, but people didn't know. So I do think that this has got to be a nationwide effort. And I think it's important to document uh, this so that we can get the data correct with regard to how effective the vaccine is, as a matter of fact. Absolutely. And speaking about the vaccine, a lot of people are scrambling and in this particular moment as we've transitioned from one administration to another. We're only a little more than a week into it. Um, But one example of 
just how frustrating this process can be. Last week, uh, it came out that a 33-year-old Milwaukee Bucks executive skipped the line and got the vaccine for himself at a nursing home. Um, I think stories like this and anecdotes like this, um, you know, may make it less likely for people who don't have those privileges um, to seek out the vaccine, maybe thinking that they won't have access because you see people of privilege jumping the line. How can we uh, both educate folks on how to get the vaccine, right? I mean, access is the, is the critical component here, but also try to change the narrative around, around access so it doesn't seem like, you know, rich people and people who have friends um, at the CVS aren't skipping the line ahead of people who are the most vulnerable? Well, you know, I, I think COVID-19 vaccines treatment equity is a really, really important issue, even from the vendors uh, who gets the vaccination, because just like you said in, in the start of your, your, your monologue, I mean, systemic racism affects every aspect of this disease, uh, and not just the numbers of people who get it and who die, but who will get the vaccines actually in their arms. I think it's extremely important uh, that the Biden-Harris uh, administration recognizes this and will double down on their efforts to get the vaccines uh, out in the right places. Um, you know, it doesn't do any good to have, you know, your CVS uh, administer if, if, if it doesn't touch those rural counties in, in, in South Carolina, for example, um, if people have to have a car in order to drive uh, to the sites. I think it's important to have culturally competent uh, um, uh, facilities. I think it's also important, Zerlina, that we're going to have vaccines that don't require uh, two injections. I think that that's going to help us reach more uh, low-income communities. Uh, we're we're going to have vaccines that don't require the super uh, hyper refrigeration. And so I think that we, we should not settle for the hunger games and, and go for the gold mm -hmm. and try to make sure that there are no communities left behind. That Defense Production Act needs to be put into full motion to make sure that we don't have people uh, game in the system because they'll, they'll be able to get a, a vaccine like everyone else. That's so right about the Hunger Games. As much as I love Katniss and I sometimes want to wear my hair in a braid and do, you know, bow and arrows, I don't want to actually live the Hunger Games. Like, I don't want to actually reenact that. I, I like it as fantasy. Um, in terms of voting rights, let's turn to the, that uh, the topic of voting rights and in terms of post-2020 election, after a record-breaking voter turnout, state legislatures across the country, they responded in predictable fashion. They have filed 106 bills to tighten voting rules, including in key battleground states like Georgia, Arizona, and Wisconsin. You know, typically these bills are introduced by Republicans, you know, right after they lose an election. That's pretty close, usually. And without the Voting Rights Act that used to protect uh, voters from these kinds of shenanigans, why do you why do they pose this this kind of legislation right after an election? And how can we fight back uh, as American citizens who care about everyone having access? I don't even think access to voting is a partisan issue, but certainly as a Democrat, how do you think Democrats can work to push back against this kind of legislation on the state level? Well, Zerlina, I mean, historically, since it is Black History Month, it's really important to note that Black people have fought for the right to vote uh, from the beginning of, of being here. And once we were, quote unquote, free, we still were not able uh, to vote with impunity. Uh, I think the Ku Klux Klan, one of their great legacies was to kill people who tried to vote, particularly in primaries. And we didn't really have the right to vote until 1965 with the Voting Rights Act. And since then, we have seen uh, all, in particularly in certain places in the South, them try to erect barrier after barrier after barrier to, our, to, to Black people not being able to vote. The biggest demonstration of that currently um, was the president trying to overturn the election in places like Philadelphia, Detroit, Milwaukee. Uh, you get my drift. Uh, in terms of who lives there. Yep. So this has been a, this has been a fight that every generation of black people uh, and, and their supporters have had to fight. So when they uh, repealed Section 5, when the Supreme Court uh, uh, overturned 
uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. That meant that all of these state legislatures, county governments could, could change voting places, change voting rules, uh, uh, disadvantage minority communities uh, with impunity. Uh, this is the reason that we need so desperately to have the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act passed. And uh, I, uh, I am hoping that uh, Joe Biden and uh, Kamala Harris make this a priority. Now that we have unified government, we should not allow anything to stop us from uh, putting in statute the right for every American to vote and not be hindered by uh, racial barriers. Absolutely not. I think voting um, should be mandatory and, and accessible by every, you know, for everyone. Uh, Congresswoman Gwen Moore, thank you so much for being here. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.